Happy Tuesday, Pacer Nation. Welcome back to another episode here of your go-to Pacers podcast, Setting the Pace. I'm your host, Alex Gold. I'm joined today by Michael Focci. Focci, we're here to talk about some Game 2 adjustments and what the Pacers can do tonight. So I'm kind of curious, where do you want to get things started? I'm just going to call it right now a little bit of a hot take. It's getting a little little sizzling out here. Uh, Tyrese Halbert's putting up the first shot in this game just to say this one's going to be different, and I've heard the people. Okay. I mean, I don't That's know who's going to get the first how shot. How many times do you see Tyrese take the first shot? Now I'm not really thinking Not a lot. And I, I'm curious if that just sets the tone to just be like, hey, this goes through me. I got to be the guy. I'm putting up that first shot. We typically see like a Miles Turner put up like the first shot or, that's or something I think of the sort. Be. And that's how it, that's that would be if I was on a game show. That would be my normal answer to say. I'm calling Tyrese Halliburton puts up that first shot and sets the tone right then and there. If Halliburton hits that shot, this fan base is going to go wild. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that definitely like Tyrese is looking for a shot a little bit more in, mm-hmm. in the flow of the game, not overdoing it. Right. Yeah. That's kind of one of the big adjustments to me, I think, that needs to happen for Indiana. But I also just think that this team just needs to play a little bit more under control and play play a faster pace. If you go back and watch this game, when they had moments of playing at a faster pace, they had some better looks, mm-hmm. and, and they scored in rhythm. This is what this team does. I don't really think they're a great half-court offense. I know that their stats might prove them, you know, prove them to be better in the half-court. And I know Pascal Siakam was you know, a bucket, but it's it's hard for me to think that Pascal Siakam is going to replicate what he did in Game One and Game Two. A lot I to think ask. they're going to make adjustments, and I think Pascal's just—I mean, thirty-six points is just not the norm for Pascal. We don't usually see him no. score that many, so other guys are going to have to step up. And I think that now that they got the Game One jitters out of the way, I'm expecting a more confident, a little bit more of a hungry team because this Pacers team is pretty resilient. And I think when their backs against the wall, that's when they play their best. So with or without Giannis for Milwaukee. I think Indiana is going to say, we got to get one here. We let one go in game one because we were so, so bad, as Rick Carlisle called it, embarrassing. We've got to get this one back, and I think that they're going to do everything they can to put up a much, much better fight than they did in game one. I just think you could only go up from here. And, yeah, can Siakam give you 36 again? That's a lot to ask. Could he give you 25? Yeah, I really do think that he can. But I also feel like you could look at the stat sheet and you see Turner at 17, but – it really wasn't like that. It was on five of 17 shooting. I think that Miles Turner can give you a much better performance. So I think that, you know, from, from Halliburton and Turner, you know, I think uh, it's not to say they owe us one, but I think they're going to put their best foot forward. And then I just think that that bench, you know, just to put it in perspective, that is the best bench in the NBA. Even if, if you shorten the rotations, you should expect better games out of Jalen Smith, who I felt that at times was, was pretty rough. And mm-hmm. I, I think that when you talk about those jitters, that was that was evident early on. I mean, I mentioned it last episode. They had about seven turnovers in about the first 15 minutes of gameplay. That's, you know, not to say a game's worth of turnovers almost, but that's a lot of turnovers that early on. I feel that the Pacers can just keep it keep it calm, play their style, maybe keep the turnovers down, maybe go into halftime at three or four. That's going to make a big difference because anytime they were trying to really become a threat, they were getting in their own way. And I think that they were their own worst enemy at times. There's been a lot of debate on, on social media from Pacer fans between should Jalen Smith get them back up five minutes or should it be Isaiah Jackson? I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are on that. I thought that Jalen was really rough in, in game one. Uh, like Jalen Smith has had a good year, uh, but Isaiah Jackson played the Bucks well this year. He really did. He was a bright spot off the bench. I know a lot of players played well against Milwaukee. I think Jalen Smith deserves another crack at it, but, I mean, this is a guy that had – Two turnovers, zero made shots. I mean, he did rebound the ball a little bit, but I just felt that there wasn't a lot of uh, – he was a minus 13 in the game. I know not a lot of Pacers were were better, but Isaiah Jackson only getting two minutes. It's really hard to gauge anything that he did well or didn't do in the game. But I think that – and this is something we've said, that Isaiah could have opportunities in this series based on how he played – Earlier, he had like 16 points, nine boards in a game against uh, Milwaukee this year. And I I think that he does bring a a little bit something different. Not the three-point shooting, but he does bring a little bit of a different element to the game than Jalen Smith. I would say that if Jalen Smith was the only player on the bench that played bad in the first game, then maybe you maybe give Isaiah more of a chance here. But I think because everybody was just not good in that game, game one, it seems a little bit overreactionary to me to just pull Jalen from the rotation. 
And, and honestly, I, I thought Jalen did a good job on the offensive glass. I think he had five offensive rebounds out of the seven rebounds that he had. So he was able to provide some stuff. Like it wasn't like he was just a negative out there completely. I know that his plus minus was a negative, but I still feel like he contributed in different ways. It just, you know, there wasn't a lot of great shots. And, and some of the shots that the Pacers took were just bad. Like uh, I went back and I was rewatching some of this game. I put myself to that misery, Fachi. Ooh, that's, and, that's, a, that's a lot of misery right there. So, so, so to kind of end the first quarter, like Tyrese Halbert hits a jumper to make it 2019. And I'm thinking to myself with like under two minutes left to play, like what happened in that final, you know, two minutes of play in, in, in the first quarter? Well, Damian Lillard dribbles the ball out of bounds after Tyrese does it off of his leg. Pacers get the ball back. Tyrese runs a pick and roll, and he throws the ball about four feet behind Jalen Smith. Milwaukee gets out in transition. Malik Beasley hits a three. Very next play down, Ben Shepard misses a three. He comes down and fouls Pat Connaughton on a three. He gets an and one. So now you go from being down one to being down eight. And then Obi Toppin is able to, you know, secure an offensive rebound or get a pass from TJ McConnell, who I think I think that's what happened. There was like two or three misses on one possession. Jalen got like two or three offensive rebounds. Obi Toppin was able to put, you know, a layup in at the end, end of that quarter. And then Dame came down and hit that step back three to give the Bucks a nine point lead heading into the end of the first or heading into the second quarter. So I, I was just watching that little moment there, and I'm thinking, okay, in a minute and about 40 seconds, the Pacers really let this game kind of get away from them. And then they start out the second quarter. I think it was an all-bench lineup, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe Pascal mm -hmm. had come in pretty early, I think, maybe for somebody. But the Bucks went on another 10-2 to run, and, and now they had a 20-4 to run and really separated it. I know that a lot of people have said that Dame just went crazy in the second quarter, which he did. And he was fantastic. But most of that run was not all just Dame shots. So I, I just felt like Indiana just got a little sloppy, got a little careless. And those turnovers led to touchdowns for Milwaukee. And that's where I think for Indiana, they just have to be much more disciplined with their decision making, whether that's shot selection, whether that's, you know, running the offense and making the right passes. They have to be a little bit more disciplined and make the right moves and, and right plays at the right time and not get so caught up in the, like you said, the early game jitters, things like that, because that was part of it. But the other part was they were just discombobulated. There were some lineups out there that didn't play a whole lot in the regular season. It felt like like McDermott playing with the starters is a little bit of a wrinkle there. So I just kind of feel like maybe slow down. I know you want to play your pace fast still, but in terms of like your, your, your shot selection and your decision-making slow down and make the right play. And, and don't just make this quick reactionary play because you're trying to hit a home run instead of hitting singles to knock down that lead. And when you try hitting home runs and you miss, that's when, the, when Milwaukee can just extend that lead even more. And that's why they got it by 30. Yeah. And it's true. And even later in the game, when the Pacers had that opportunity, they, they cut it down to 12. I just felt like instead of just trying to get that easy two, a lot of times they kept trying to hit threes and they kept mm -hmm. missing threes. And it was like, guys, you can go from 12 down to 10 down to eight and give yourself that, that opportunity where if it was single digits, Going in the fourth, you feel like anything could happen. And I felt like the Pacers were were forcing it a bit. And, you know, just like you mentioned, trying to hit those home runs. I mean, they were 8 of 38 from three. That's miserable. They could only improve from here. I mean, if the Pacers are to shoot 35% in, in uh, you know, game two, that could be a solid improvement. You, know, you talked about it last episode. Milwaukee outscored the Pacers from three-point land by 18 points. That is a big difference. And, uh, you know, the Bucks shot 14 of 37, it's about 38%. That could easily come down. So I do think the Pacers have a lot of avenues where they should improve just because they played that bad in game one. But just, uh, you know, you mentioned a little bit of that timeline. I had that timeline. I meant to share it last episode. But, yeah, Halliburton hits that shot. It's a 20-footer, it's a makes it 20 to 19. Uh, the Bucks are up one. That's it with a minute and 55 uh, to go in the first quarter. Um, the next time he shot it, it was 37 seconds left in the second quarter. Tyrese. So much of that game, yep, so yeah. much of that game had changed within that span. And then the 32nd mark of the second quarter, that, that's when he had that shot. He doesn't shoot the ball again until 3 minutes and 57 seconds left in the third quarter. His next shot came with 2 minutes and 40 seconds in the fourth quarter. So it was just like most of the time he was almost going the full quarter without getting a shot up. And I just felt like so much was happening during that that game that, yeah, the 15 shots, that's where I really think he's got to be at. Later we're going to bring on J.J. He's going to talk about that. Hey, Tyrese has even mentioned that he wanted to really kind of be at that 14-shot mark he said in the past. I think it's got to be there. And if you look at that, 
That's double what he shot in this game. That's a big difference for this Pacers team and the confidence that they have. I mean, at what point in this game did you ever see the bench kind of getting up and, you know, giving it high fives or anything? There was never one of those moments. And yeah. I think the Pacers need to see a little bit of that momentum because when Dame was going bananas, the whole team was feeding off of it. And the Pacers just need to see a couple of those shots go down early. And I feel like if they do, the whole team is just going to kind of be uplifted a bit. And I, and that's why you really hope the Pacers can kind of get off to a little bit of a hotter start. And first quarters have plagued them. It really has. But a, a hot start in this game could go a long way for this Pacers team in terms of being able to tie this series up and go back to Indiana at one apiece. Yeah, they just need to get their mojo back and get their vibe back. I think if they get their confidence back, like they're just going to be a much different team. They look like they lost their confidence in this game. And they felt like they were a team with their backs against the wall that really didn't, you know, how to know how to fight back. And I kind of talked about that with Derek. You know, the Pacers just kept getting punched in the face, but they weren't punching back. And I'm hoping that they punch back in game two. And it's a great opportunity for them. But I will say this the point of attack defense did get better on Damian Lillard it did. in that second half. They did a good job kind of double teaming and blitzing that pick and roll. And I know that that's going to be probably something they continue to do because it, it was effective in that second half. So, we know that there's a chance Milwaukee will will find adjustments for for how Damian Damian Lillard can 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 be effective offensively, but I will say this: one thing that the the Bucks did a good job of is getting Middleton and Bobby Portis in spots where they're very comfortable, and both of those guys kind of like to post up and get their backs to the basket and score in kind of that mid range type thing. If I'm Indiana, one thing that I think I would do a little bit better of is if Portis or Middleton get the ball with their back to the basket, and they're kind of on, on an isolation play right here. Maybe it's Neesmith guarding Middleton. And we know, like, Neesmith can play pretty physical with Middleton, but Middleton has a three-inch height advantage. So he still can get shots off, off over him. And, and no matter how hard Neesmith is playing, I, I think I would be a little bit more cognizant and maybe a little bit more aggressive defensively and, and trying to double-team that to get the ball out of Middleton's hands and kind of reverse the ball back. I know that it might end up in Damian Lillard's hands and things like that, but if you can kind of disrupt the offensive flow and what they want to get, especially if there's moments when Middleton and, and Lillard are not in the game together, double team that, make a Pat Connaughton hit an open three. I know that he can do it, but I would much rather let Pat Connaughton shoot a three as the shot clock's expiring than allow Bobby Portis or Chris Middleton to be on, you know, their own little island on the post, you know, on the low post back there and, and, and making turnaround jump shots. That's where they really thrive. So that to me is one thing I would do defensively a little bit better is is not allow them to get into their spots where they're very comfortable because we saw Milwaukee do a good job of trying to disrupt Tyrese from getting comfortable. I think Indiana has to do that. And, and I'm not as worried about Portis, more more so Middleton, but there there's times when there was a time in that game where Portis had like eight points in a row. That yeah. can't happen. The crowd feeds off of that. Bobby Portis is he is their like TJ McConnell, you know, really gets that crowd rocking. But also for, for Middleton, you know, you shared last episode that uh, Damian Lillard was actually a minus six mm -hmm. in that game, as great as he was. Middleton was a plus 25. That's yeah. a big difference. Middleton was was really huge for the Bucs. Um, he actually had 15 points in that second half, and they, they were big buckets. They really were. So I think that for Indiana right now, you're, you're looking in the mirror. You're saying that we haven't earned the right to be predicted to beat anyone in an upset. Because another thing that we talked about, home teams, they went undefeated in game one. I mean, they really brought it uh, across the NBA. And I think that uh, the Bucks were just a, another one of those teams that they, they got the job done. They are the higher seed. They have the experience. And I think that Indiana is just a team that thrives when they are, um, you know, kind of being slept on. And I think that they, they have every right to now feel that, hey, we haven't arrived. We'll get there. But I, I think that as going into game two, this team, they're going to they're gonna come ready. Playoff experience, it was real. They didn't have it. And now they got a little bit of it. And I think that they could say, hey, you know what? This is unlike anything we've ever felt before. You got to be ready for game two. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. And I will just say real quick, it, it, it'd be a good time for us to kind of just get an injury update here, Fachi, with our Unified Healing segment and talk about some of the injuries here. We'll talk to you a little bit more about Unified Healing. But, you know, they're all about the EE system, which is very easy and affordable. So make sure you guys, you know, listen to our ad and check it out. But if you're looking at injuries here, the only real injury here is Giannis Antetokounmpo. And it, and it seems like he's going to be doubtful for game two once again. 
could be ruled out as early as Tuesday morning if he's not been already ruled out by the time we finish recording this podcast. But that's a big loss for Milwaukee, but they were able to win without him, and they proved that in game one. Uh, I still think that if he's out for a significant time in this playoff series, that it's going to be huge. But, um, you know, Indiana can't once again overlook Milwaukee without him. They have to come out and say, you know what, this team was capable of beating us. And, and, inj and injuries are, are, are fine on the Pacers side. Everybody seems to be pretty healthy. Matherin's the only one who is out with that shoulder uh, injury. So other than that, I think it's good, though, to know that the Pacers are pretty healthy. And from a Milwaukee standpoint, um, just Giannis being out, which everybody already kind of knows. So they they have an idea of, of what they need to do to win. And I think that that just kind of makes it a fair fight heading into game two because it's a, it's a, it's a rematch from game one. And Milwaukee's trying to prove like it was – you know, not a fluke, and Indiana's trying to prove that, hey, it was a fluke. We can take this team down. Hey, Ox, what I have in my hand right now is a glass of water, and i tell you one thing. It's half full, all right? Before we bring on the Bucks, we're going to bring on JJ. You're not going to want to miss this. Jeremiah Johnson coming right at you. Joining us from downtown Milwaukee, he is waiting for Game 2 to come back, and we're going to talk adjustments and what happened in Game 1. It is the sideline reporter, Jeremiah Johnson for Valley Sports Indiana. JJ, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the show. How are we doing? Good, Alex Bocci. It's uh, great to speak with you virtually. I know fans are a little upset, a little anxious, a combination of the two. So we'll see what happens here between the games one and two. Hey, man, I'm, I'm ready for game two. I know it can't come soon enough, but luckily there's not going to be that type of delay that we saw from the regular season into game one. But JJ, I would say, you know, my first question for you was what was the vibe of the team post game after that game one? Um, you know, it was weird because we had a longer post game show on the court than we normally do because we were carrying the press conferences and because we did not have to fly out after the game, a little bit of inside baseball here. When we're on the road for post game shows, it's normally a, a short show. It's about 15 minutes. And once we hear from head coach Rick Carlisle, we don't have a camera in the locker room. So we're pretty much wrapping up. And we were on the air for about 35 minutes. And so we were waiting a little bit to hear from players in the press conference room. And we heard that it was going to be Miles Turner and Pascal Siakam. Pascal normally takes a long time to get ready. So we didn't think we would get him. We were trying to get Miles Turner. But I'll be honest, by the time the show ended and then I made my way back there, most of the players from the locker room had already left. And then uh, I listened to Miles Turner and Pascal Siakam. And I think because the bad half was the first half and then the second half, there were some positives. And it wasn't one of these heartbreaking, excruciating finishes. Um, it was – and I, I think Pascal was probably one of the people that spoke up in the locker room. And he said that, you know, or maybe Miles did, that those two and Tyrese got together and talked. And I think there was a, a message that was sent after the game that it's a best-of-seven series for a reason – you know you didn't play well, but it, it, there's no need to walk out of that building with your heads hanging down or crying. Just think about the things that you can do and be anxious to get out there. And that was the vibe that I got more than anything was, man, let's play another game. I know it's going to be 48 hours, but they were all anxious for just another opportunity because they, to a man, know that wasn't Patriots basketball. Yeah, 94 points. It, it just didn't feel like they were playing their pace either. It kind of felt like Milwaukee was kind of dictating things, but – you know, when you were in the arena for the game, did you feel the nerves from this team before the game started? Not before the game. I mean, you're you're going to have the similar, you know, intensity coming running out on the court. You're in enemy territory, so you know you have to overcome that. So definitely not before the game, but just in some of the shots that I saw early on and maybe a little bit of the apprehension from certain players, you could tell. And, and I was – Curious whether that'd be something I would bring up, but if you were watching on Valley Sports, I did interview Lloyd Pierce coming out to start the third quarter, and I asked him what changed from you know late first quarter into the second quarter, and he, of course, gave credit to Damian Lillard, but then I asked if he thought there were some nerves or maybe some jitters from some of the players, and, and he didn't hide from that at all. He said absolutely, and that was something they needed to overcome. The best way I think those guys can get into the game is by playing hard-nosed defense, and then the rest takes care of itself. I, I could tell there were some guys pressing with their shots, or maybe you know you had a three-point shot that's a good look, and maybe it doesn't even draw iron, or it's a bad miss, and then it gets in your head a little bit, and it causes you to be um, a little bit apprehensive, and maybe you start thinking about the moment. So nothing I saw before the game, 
But in watching those first six minutes, both teams were a little sloppy. Let's be honest. It was, I think, 20 to 19 or 21 20 before all of a sudden Damian Lillard caught fire and then they got into that rhythm. It makes you wonder what would have happened if one of the Pacers players could have gotten into a similar rhythm and then the Pacers could have been the one to take that nine point lead at the end of the first quarter. Who knows how things would have gone? So that was a crucial stretch at the end of the first quarter. Yeah, we always thought that in season tournament was going to be a great pre-playoff type of exposure to this team, but we realized you just can't simulate playoff experience. The Bucks have it. Most of the Pacers do not. Do you think that this game one was kind of that harsh reality of, hey, welcome to the playoffs. This will benefit you in the long run because you could feel the difference between the regular season and the playoffs, and it happened quick to this team. I think there's something else to it, though, as well, because those in-season tournament games, um, say what you want about them, they had a high level of intensity. I mean, you've heard players talk about that atmosphere of the Boston Celtics game being unmatched in recent memory, and you'd have to go back to those playoff games where Miles Turner thought it was on that similar level. I can't speak to Las Vegas because I wasn't there, and it may have been a little bit of a unique environment, especially maybe that first game when maybe the building wasn't quite as as filled up. But make no mistake, all those players were playing for a lot. I mean, there was personal incentive, and they were going for it. The difference that I think that happened here, at least in game one, and it's the approach that the opponents have towards the Pacers. You can make a case Boston comes to Gamebridge Fieldhouse for that in-season tournament game. Their bags are packed for Las Vegas. Yeah, the Pacers are a nice story, but we're the Boston Celtics. We're the team expected to be in the finals. And maybe if you let up just a little bit, you show, we've seen around the NBA, you can get beat. So I don't think they gave the Pacers maybe that full amount of respect. The Pacers took advantage. You go to Las Vegas. The Bucks probably the same way. Uh, you know, even though they had a little bit of an up-and-down start, it was the plucky underdogs, the Pacers, that maybe they didn't get the full attention. Now you go fast forward. You go to this playoff series, the Pacers beat the Bucks four out of five. There's been some bad blood. So the Pacers, like the Bucks, are fully focused. They're the team that had to, for a week, read the press clippings and hear the first takes of the world and the NBA today all picking the Pacers. That was my concern going into this. You, you, the Pacers are used to being the team that has to kind of overcome the odds. They're not used to being the team that gets all the pats on the back. And I'm not going to say that affected their play, but it might have affected the way the Bucks prepared and how focused they were to start. I think that's a great point. I think that Indiana has always done a better job when they're kind of viewed as the underdog instead of the top dog. And it's, it's a different place to be at because your back's more up against the wall and you're trying to prove that you're trying to prove people right instead of prove people wrong. And it's just a different, you know, type of dynamic, but I am curious in that second half, obviously Indiana played a much better second half. What did you notice different from that group that, that was out there playing that they did differently instead of the first half? Well, obviously you go into halftime and when one player has 35 points, your whole objective is going to say, let someone else beat us. It's not going to be Damian Lillard. And they made him, you know, take the ball out of his hands. At the same time, you know, you still have Chris Middleton, who's capable of hitting some big shots. And Bobby Porter said different stretches of the game was affected. But that would probably be the biggest thing. You know, nobody, Damian Lillard did not get into a rhythm. He's the, I'm not going to say the sole reason, but the game was a one-point game. He goes on the run at the end of the first quarter, and then it carries over into the second quarter. He's the reason the Bucks built that lead. So if you take him out of the equation, you're going to instantly have more success. I thought early in the third quarter, the Pacers had some sets and ran some offense to knock down some shots. So they were doing a lot better. But you're also going to have human nature kick in in, in the opposite way. Just like the Bucks were ready to go to start, they probably let it up a little bit as well. So you can't just take too much from the second half and say, oh, the Pacers figured everything out. You can't dig that big of a hole, and I don't think the Bucks ever seriously felt threatened in the second half. So uh, the the one thing I'll just say is it felt, in those of you watching, it felt more like Pacers basketball in the second half. The first half was it looked like imposters wearing the Pacers jerseys at times. It just wasn't what we're used to seeing, and you hope in a best-of-seven series that can be the the learning point, the, 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 the game you forget about, and the rest of the series you can at least – Play your style. Play your basketball. I mean, 94 points total, even despite a good second half, that's just not what you expect. So um, I, I don't think the guys were nervous in the second half. Maybe they were a little more angry, you know, fired up, whatever. 
and that caused them to play a little bit better. But um, it, I'm I'm finding myself with mixed opinions on how much to take from the second half. Other than the adjustments they made to Damian Lillard, they showed that. So then the Bucks will be prepared for that. How do you you know step step in front of what Milwaukee might do, um, anticipating what the Pacers did in the second half happening in Game Two? And the Pacers just – they kept hitting snooze, I think, in that first half. But one guy that did wake up on the right side of the bed was Pascal Siakam, the man who has a ring on this Pacers team. He really came into play. And I think when the Pacers looked to make that trade for Siakam, you hoped who could be the number two. Well, he looked every bit of being a number one yesterday for Indiana. I mean, what could you take away from that man who has been there and absolutely showed up when it mattered most? Yeah, I mean, I just found myself watching, thinking this is why they made the trade for Pascal Siakam. And while nothing is set in stone for the future, you have to at least be optimistic and, and thinking and hoping he's going to be a foundation piece. And you don't really know if a player is a regular season player or a guy that is going to be a really good postseason player when you get them. I mean, you have to see it in action. And so I saw enough in that one game, and you had a pretty good idea he, the moment would not be too big for him, but he, he more than anyone else, you were just confident he was actually in his zone, in his rhythm, um, even more than in the regular season. So he might be a guy that craves that moment. And I thought it was good for even the fan base. You know, we, it's such a, a reactionary society right now with social media that, you know, after two weeks, people were saying, oh, why'd you get this guy? And then uh, even even like two or three weeks ago, I had people saying that the chemistry was off and. I, they didn't understand it. I, the good part to me is he's a guy you can count on. He's going to bring it. The moment won't be too big for him. And when you've got a young team, you need to have veterans, not just guys that say the right things. I mean, they've got some of those guys, but guys that also let their play do the talking as well that you can count on. So um, dependability, reliability to have a guy like that. Uh, no matter what happens in this series, it gives me uh, a good feeling moving forward with that four, four position. One of the reasons why a lot of people were picking Indiana to maybe win this series is because of the uncertainty of Giannis Antetokounmpo. Kind of curious your thoughts on how the Bucks are so much more different without Giannis and what kind of wrinkle that threw into the Pacers' game plan. I know that they said all week long they were re they were preparing as if Giannis was going to play, but we, we have to know probably there was some preparing for if Giannis didn't play too. But just kind of curious, you know, what makes the Bucks different without Giannis and maybe a little bit more difficult to prepare for? I felt like early in the season, Damian Lillard wasn't necessarily looking over his shoulder, but he was kind of walking on ice that you didn't know if it would break or not. He was kind of treading lightly. He didn't have that, you know, I'm, I'm the guy. I'm going to do whatever it takes to win like you saw so much of the time that he was in Portland, and that makes sense. I mean, you're coming into Giannis's team. It's not Damian Lillard's team. But you know going into a playoff series, that's why you're acquired if you're uh, Damian Lillard. And you know that Giannis is not going to play. And so at that point, you're free to, to be the best version of yourself. So uh, to me, that would be the biggest difference, that when Giannis is on the court, you've got a guy that's able to, you know, catch and shoot and and take shots when Giannis is doubled, but not play the way that he's played for most of his career. So I was surprised that the Bucs played as good defensively. But the other thing that's, you know, a little bit different, I don't want to give Patrick Beverly too much credit because uh, I think he's kind of can be a pest, and I don't know if he's going to play great for the entire series. But it's good to have pests, and I thought he did make an impact defensively to where they were struggling at the beginning of the season, even with Giannis on the perimeter. They figured out they needed to improve and upgrade their perimeter defense, and they were much better in that area. They made life difficult, even though I, I can sense a little bit of a rivalry going on individually, not that they're you know similar-level players, but uh, we've seen enough of Tyrese Halliburton and Patrick Beverly going at it a little bit that there's something there. And he did make it hard on, on Tyrese Halliburton. So um, the big thing is you focus so much of your attention on Giannis. I still say the Pacers are better playing against teams when they're at full strength. It sounds silly to say, but, you know, look at the, this season. How many times has one guy been out? You let up just a little, or maybe you don't let up, but it's not who you prepared for to beat you, and it doesn't go well. But yet the Pacers are a team that gets up for the big moments 
against the best of the best. Their record against teams above 500 is one of the best in the NBA, and it's not just due to playing those teams when they were injured. It's playing them at full strength. Um, and they've also been resilient all season. So I do have that as sort of a lo- level of optimism for game two. Uh, it, there doesn't seem to be a real uh, bit of optimism that you're going to see Giannis at least anytime soon. I mean, at least for game two, they'll probably list him as questionable or doubtful. But uh, you're you're going to see, I think, the similar Bucks players you saw in game one and game two. Yeah, I mean, uh, optimism, I, I think, is the right word because this is a Pacers team that in the regular season – Led the NBA in points per game. Led the NBA in field goal percentage. Did a lot of things really well. We talked about it. 94 points. They shot sub 40%. But this Pacers team is too electric offensively to keep that type of play up. So do you think it's more of just, hey, they're going to come out guns blazing. In specific, a guy like Tyrese Halliburton, I mean, look, if anybody even logged on to social media, it was a dark place yesterday. It really was. But this team is prepared to live and die by who their leader is. Do you think that Tyrese is going to be a little bit more aggressive to start the game? Because that's kind of been a little bit of the MO all year is that, hey, look, he's going to look for his teammates first and he'll get the shot going second. This is the playoffs. Might need to be uh, roles reversed a little bit. I remember back to the start of last season, and I don't think it was necessarily what a message that would come from from coaches. It may may have been something with Chad Buchanan, but it might have been something on his own where he said he wanted to kind of look down and force himself to be more aggressive. And I remember 14 being a number that he had said was, uh, you know, I need to have at least 14 field goal attempts in a game because that means I'm into the game. And you know, it can be a little bit arbitrary to just randomly pick a number like that. But uh, I think that he'll probably have that same approach. But personally, I don't want him just to come out and not be the player that he is. He's not a Damian Lillard guy that you'd like to see just shooting, shooting, shooting nonstop because getting his teammates involved is one of the things he does best. But there has to be a little bit more balance. And I think he would understand there has to be more aggression than there was. So much of the season, you've seen him come out, get his teammates involved, and then he takes over in the third quarter. It was just abnormal in that, well, starting the third quarter, you're down 27. So, yeah, he could have come out and taken more shots there. But really, the best way for the Pacers to get back into the game was get the ball to whoever is open and have them hope water finds its love level a little bit. So I almost think that you were never close enough to say, ah, why didn't you shoot more in the second half? Um, but he, I think he acknowledges everything. And the good news is from watching – practice and just being around uh getting to the arena and, and from i think he's in a good place mentally he's not down about that game one i think he's uh you know disappointed he, he has a little bit of resolve personally that he knows he needs to do better and he said that three or four different times so you'll see a different tyrese halliburton but i'm not the guy that wants him to sit there and and just chuck it from the cheap seats all game because he's only his best when it's a mixture so mm-hmm. uh Nine points, eight assists, or whatever it ended up being, not what you want to see. Uh, I think it'll, it'll it'll look more like you know twenty and ten, but I I don't think it's he's got to go into this game saying I gotta I gotta score thirty five. Yeah, I think when one of the reporters asked Rick Carlisle about Tyrese's scoring after the game, he he basically said it's not about Tyrese's scoring, it's about the team scoring, which it, it, it makes sense. But I think from everybody's perspective, like Tyrese is supposed to be the face of the franchise, the number one, number two guy with Pascal Siakam. So I think just seeing him kind of finish fifth in shot attempts, it's, it's a little bit concerning. I think that's one adjustment people are looking to see, hopefully moving forward with, you know, game two, we'll we'll kind of see how much more aggressive he is, but I'm curious, are there any other adjustments that you think this team needs to make for game two to try to help prepare themselves for, for evening the series at one, one. You know, it's tough. You don't necessarily know what Milwaukee is going to do, but there's the film that's out there. You saw what they were doing with Tyrese Halliburton. So I guess I would just say if he gets the ball out of his hands, figure out some action that he gets it back a little quicker. There were a few times where he didn't have it, but then he was open. Uh, I'd I'd have everybody just keeping an eye on knowing where Tyrese is at all times. If they're going to double him at half court and they're going to blitz the pick, well, he's got to get it out of his hands, but then quickly maybe get it back to him. I mean, just you want to see a little bit more of that. It's one thing I was watching and waiting to see if the pace could be what you expected in the playoffs. It seems crazy to me that 
the game has to slow down because it's the playoffs, even though that's what everyone says. But we know they've got to get out and run for them to be their best. And we also know Milwaukee, I mean, Doc Rivers said as much before the game, those guys are going to not be crashing the glass for offensive rebounds, except for maybe two of them. Three of them are going to run back, or maybe one of them is just going to immediately find Tyrese Halliburton when a shot goes up. So know that they're doing that and figure out how you can combat that a little bit. Maybe have a little bit more of Andrew Nemhard, where, you know, you get a rebound, you throw it to him, and then Tyrese gets it in transition. Uh, I think that that's the two playmaker um, starting five. It's been more for Andrew Nemhard's defense than his playmaking, and then we've seen more of – you know, Tyrese off ball when TJ McConnell comes into the game. So um, that could be something, um, but it just, you'll know when you see it is probably what I would say to sit here after just one game, you're going to need to make adjustments. And that's a big, you know, a little bit of a cliche in the playoffs. So they're going to try and tweak some different things, but they can't just sit there after one game and throw everything they did in 82 games away and say, Damian Lillard scored 35 and couldn't miss and was shooting from half court and say you've got to rip up everything you did and start over again. I mean, that's that's kind of that's kind of silly to me. I know that's what fans want. I mean, they, they want to see a, a specific change. The, the tweaks will be more minor adjustments, maybe not something I can just sit here and tell you on a podcast. Yeah, I don't think the Pacers need to switch up their starting lineup or anything drastic like that. Like, this is the group. But is there perhaps someone that you think maybe – off the bench, might rise to the occasion, have uh, one of those breakout games. Like, we always remember, it wasn't off the bench, but the Bogdanovich game, you know, against the Cavs, or one of those big performances that might come off the bench, perhaps? I think Obi Toppin is someone that is capable of tilting the series a little bit in the Pacers' favor in game two. I, I don't think he was happy with how he played. He's key to the second unit pace. It's not just... You know, TJ McConnell pushing the pace. It's often TJ running, and then all of a sudden, Obi sprinting down court as well. You got to be a little careful if it's your big that's running down the court because the guy he's guarding could be the one that's crashing the glass. So, most importantly, you got to secure those rebounds. But I probably will be watching him, and it wouldn't surprise me. I know people have been critical online of, you know, well, there should not be any time in the game that you don't have either Tyrese Halliburton or Pascal Siakam on the court. I can, I can make a case for that. Uh, I just I don't want to see them forget about the bench at all because I, I still think that they have a better bench than Milwaukee. And over the course of a series where everyone was rested going into game one, there's not going to be as much rest between games one and two. You have a little break before game three. But I thought in a series against an older team that the Pacers could wear them out eventually. That's another reason I had optimism for this series. I have optimism. I mean, let's say Philadelphia ends up beating – the Knicks. I've seen the Pacers play two games in three nights against the Sixers, and they ran the Sixers out of the gym in the second half of the second game because they were worn out. So to me, it still is important to give some of those guys minutes, to have them run, to give your starters enough of a break, because I'm sure they'll they'll be willing to play more minutes, but you can't just expect them to be robots and to play the pace you want at 42 minutes. So uh um, you got to still rely on your entire team, but maybe in some smaller doses in game two. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the fan base was upset with the 11 man rotation that happened to take. Yeah, place. well, okay, all right, but it's not really an 11 man rotation. It's you're counting Jalen Smith and Isaiah Jackson as two people when in, in reality they're just one, yeah. right? I mean, two minutes so, of Jax was it. So, okay, so but, but people are saying that's 11 though. So then, right. then disregard his two minutes and say it was a 10 man rotation. Right. And Doug was barely in the game either. So it's really a nine-man rotation, and I don't think Ajax's two minutes and Doug's whatever is the reason the Pacers lost the game. Are you cool with the nine-man rotation? To me, I'm cool I, with nine. I, I think nine's fine. You want eight? I think my problem – not not my problem with nine. I don't have a problem with nine. I, I think the big thing is, is we saw Milwaukee do a very good job of staggering their lineups a little bit more, where maybe Portis would go to the bench early for Malik Beasley – and then kind of let Dame run it with more of a more of a different first unit, but then bring Middleton back with Portis that second unit. I just feel like if you're going to have Middleton and Portis out there against the Pacers bench, it's not really a bench lineup versus a bench lineup for Milwaukee because you're playing two starters. So I think there just needs to be a little bit more balance, maybe of the rotation. Um, if, if you want to go nine, that's fine. But I feel like you know one of Pascal or Tyrese. I think that's a good point. 
but even even at least one of Neesmith or Nimhart out there to have more defensive minded players out there that you feel more comfortable with. I know those guys got to get breaks, but you got to maybe try to figure out a way to stagger the minutes where maybe Shep is playing with Neesmith a little bit more or Shep's playing with Nimhart a little bit more and not just Shep and McConnell out there as your two best defenders on the wing. Yeah, I, I could see that, and I wouldn't be surprised. What I would say is if you actually dig into how the game went, you don't want, you'd like to get your starters to get in some kind of rhythm, and it took so long for them to do that in the first quarter that if you're going to take Pascal out at the six-minute mark, he's not going to feel like he got into anything, and nobody really had anything going. So if you don't have foul trouble and you had yet to really see anyone feel like they were into the game, to, to take them out then is tough, and then you go to the third quarter – you're probably playing those guys as long as you can because you wanted to try to get back into the game. So I, I think circumstances affected what happened. You can go into a game with a plan and you have to be flexible. And when you lose, everyone's going to nitpick everything that you do. But if you actually take a closer look, I would challenge when would you have taken certain guys out with how that game played out. Now, it happened so quickly at the end of the, the first quarter and then the start of the second quarter you use your timeouts, maybe there's a substitution that can be made there. And uh, who knows, maybe that that's something they would have done differently. But given <laughs> what Damian Lillard was doing, I think people are actually glossing over that and not even realizing, like, that's uh, that's something you don't see 35-point halves. And you could take the ball out of his hands. That's the, the thing they did at halftime. Maybe you could have done that a little bit earlier. Uh, that's the biggest thing. You have to observe when someone has it really going, and you got to say someone else is going to be the guy that's going to beat me. Yeah, I think what Dame did in that moment, just it swung the game. I mean, he got so hot that he was having true heat check moments where he's shooting from deep, and a, a decent chunk of the time he was still hitting those. I do think in this game there was one moment, though, when things got a little chippy between him and Andrew Nemhard that I feel that Nemhard kind of woke up, took it a little bit more personal, do you think the Pacers kind of needed a little bit of a wake-up call to say, hey, we got to punch back because we're getting hit right now. we got to get our hands up or something. For me, it felt like after that, Dame really was not um, in that same type of like momentum as he was before. Yeah, maybe he was worn out as well. I mean, he has not had his shoulder that kind of load for a while. And that gets back to my previous point that maybe fatigue sets in in this series a little bit and it and if he has to do so much, Chris Middleton, to me, is the one that really hurt him because, you know, when you took the ball out of his hands, he hit some big shots. And he has that Siakam-like playoff experience where you know mm -hmm. the moment won't be too big for him. And, you know, there is a decided experience advantage on the Bucks roster. I mean, we were talking, you know, Chris Denary brought it up on the broadcast and we talked beforehand. He asked me who had the most playoff games with the Bucks, And I knew as he asked me, it wasn't going to be the obvious guy, it's Jay Crowder with like 111 or 113 games. And and he's not even a guy you even think of. So, uh, you know, you combine that experience, the heat check, and let's just say it. I mean, you saw it all over the NBA. I'm sure the Mavericks uh, podcasters were having are having the same discussion. Their fans are right now. I don't think they're going to give up on the series because they had a bad game one. But the home court advantage was real. I mean, the way that first quarter, it was loud. They kept this music going until – someone made a basket. And at some point I'm like, all right, well, we're until they made a basket. They wanted everyone to stand on their seats, but they were playing like <laughs> the rock music or the loud music for the first three minutes of the game. And then when he started hitting those shots, the building went bonkers. It's the same way I expected to be games three and four, but it's not easy <laughs> to go in in that environment. And I think people, um, they kind of forget about that a little bit, especially watching on TV. So I understand the disappointment. It was not. Pacers basketball in the first half and Rick Carlisle said it himself so I'm not going to disagree with what he said I mean he said it was embarrassing but yeah. I'm also not going to give up on the series either knowing there's still three more games at Gambridge Fieldhouse and there's a tired an older team that you're playing against the Bucks, and we don't even know about Giannis if he's going to play in the series so uh, let's just see what happens in games two game yeah two. I will say Miles Turner I mean in his post-game press conference you know it's a very cliche thing to say but you know, a playoff series doesn't start till a road team gets that first victory is what they say. So game two, to wrap things up here, JJ, what does Indiana do differently to win that game? Um, they got to get out and run. you got to obviously hit some shots. When you start 0 for 13, it just takes you out of your rhythm. And it human nature sets in where, you know, your offense affects your defense. So 
Um, I'm not going to sit here and say they've got to have the lead at the end of the first quarter or the lead at halftime. But if they're able to have a higher scoring game and just get up and go and feel like they're in a rhythm offensively, you know, the defense creates the offense. But um, you just want to see more Pacers basketball. Everyone listening or, you know, watching, they're diehards. You know when you see it. And we know we didn't see it in game one. So I, I can't sit here and specifically say this is the area that will lead to a win. But, you know, the Pacers, I think, shot uh, 20% from three in in the season series against the Bucks, And they still won four or five. That's not ideal. Get it back up to, you know, mid-30s, closer to 40. And you're going to have a, a better chance for success. So if the three start going down, that'll be a, a big indicator. And, you know, make sure that no Buck Milwaukee player has superhuman night. Yeah, my last question for you is, you know, this this team has the fan base in the palm of their hands. It's 10 straight playoff games without a win. How starving do you think that this fan base is right now to take game two and go into Indiana in game three with a, a rowdy crowd knowing that you could take the series lead in that moment. How vital is this game to to this fan base, this team, and, and everything in between? Well, I think it's vital. I would say sometimes a win or a loss doesn't matter the margin because it only counts as one. But in this situation, no matter what happens, it needs to be close to give you a feeling like you're in this series going back home. And I know, I mean, to go back one and one, it's, it's a whole new series, right? I mean, that's ultimately what you needed, what you wanted. And – it's so easy to just be down after one loss. And I think the fan base bought into some of the hype as well, right? When you turn on the TV and everybody's picking you, then you believe it also. So Big um, time. JMV often says must win. I'm not going to sit here and say that yet because I still, if you fell down to zero, you still have three out of four at home and you've shown you can beat the Bucks, but you've got to at least play better and you've got to be right there. Yeah. Because you lost game one, you don't have the, okay, well, if you lose, it's okay. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say that. But um, you more than anything, show a competitive, entertaining, do what you do well, see your stars play well, and you'll be in position to get that boost over the weekend. But it's not going to be easy. Just because you want it to happen doesn't mean it will. Yeah, I will say this is, uh, you know, six games now the Pacers and Bucks have played each other. The Pacers won the first two. Milwaukee won the third one. Indiana wins four and five. Milwaukee won number six. So it looks like Indiana is on pace now to win two in a row based on things, you know, <laughs> following that same I like trend. you're thinking. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens, JJ. I mean, just speaking it into existence. But I uh, want to thank you so much for your time and uh, joining us here as you're on this nice little weekend getaway, I guess you could say, or a three-day getaway here in Milwaukee. Any Anything you want to plug before we wrap up here? Nope. I uh, just I know that uh, you know you have a choice during the series, and we appreciate fans watching all all season long. Give us a chance on Valley Sports during the series if you want to check out some of the other coverage. I understand, but uh, we'll do our best to amp up the broadcast. And again, we're on the air for thirty minutes after each game with the post game pressers, which I know you can't always find everywhere else. And home games, I think Pat Boylan will still be inside the locker room, so um, we'll we'll do our best to provide the coverage that you've. You've, you've hoped for for the series, and hopefully it's a long series. At least five games right now. I mean, if Pacers win the next four, you're all right with that. But I think it, I think it's going to be a long series. Hey, JJ, we appreciate you. Truly one of the best in the biz and uh, a friend of Alex and I. We always love having you on. We can't wait for the next one. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. Thanks, JJ.